Amen. <clears throat> we are in our current series that's called By Faith. And the series is looking at these different people that are mentioned in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. And uh, today we're going to be looking at a man named Noah. Now, Noah is one of those biblical characters that even if you didn't grow up in the church, if you're not a Christian, you might have heard of Noah and his ark, right? And for many of us who did grow up with maybe Christian parents who read stories to us, Bible stories to us, you might have had this story read to you. In fact, many of you may have had a children's Bible, and in that children's Bible, there were these really cute illustrations of this old man with white hair, a long white beard, and he had this really big boat, but it wasn't drawn to scale, and you had um, you know, all these cute animals, two by two, sort of going up this ramp into the ark, right? Maybe you had something like that in your childhood. You know, my kids, we went to, or when they were little, they went to a preschool called Noah's Ark. And uh, it was a very cute place. It was, <laughs> it was, it was wonderful for them. Um, you know, it, it's interesting that, um, you know, these cute depictions of Noah and his ark could cause us, though, to sort of relegate him into that category of, oh, it's just an endearing children's bedtime story. Or it's sort of this very uh, endearing fable that has a moral um, teaching built within it. But the Bible itself says something very different. The, writers, uh, the writer of Hebrews in particular and the scripture witness overall uh, compels us to look at this story with fresh eyes. And because the Lord, I believe, listed Noah in his hall of faith, there is something in this man's life that could help form and shape our own faith. We're going to be reading Hebrews 11, verse 7, and then I'm going to follow that up with the passage in Genesis that speaks of Noah's life. And so I'm going to ask us to stand as we read God's word. This is what Hebrews 11:7 7 says. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. And then in Genesis 6, it says this. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with, with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The height of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubic above, and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come in to you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Go ahead and have a seat. See, far from being just this cute uh, children's story, Noah's faith is a prime example of reverent fear. Reverent fear. That's what Hebrews 11 says. It says that Noah, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. 
So Noah's faith is characterized by this reverent fear. And it was because of this reverent fear that he made the ark. Now, in today's world, we don't speak too much about the fear of the Lord. We much more like to gravitate toward friendship with God. We like to talk about the love of God and how we're to love him, and all that is true, right? But the fear of the Lord isn't something that Christians naturally gravitate toward. And this could be because we've sort of constructed this false dichotomy that says, how could you have a friendship with God and fear of God at the same time, right? Actually, the Bible teaches something very different. In Psalm 25, 14, it says this, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. And he makes known to them his covenant. So the Bible says that if you're going to be a friend of God, you actually have to fear God, which is so counterintuitive. The fear of the Lord, it's essential for friendship with God. Not only is fear of the Lord something that you need for a friendship with God, there's also blessings that come to us through our friendship or our fear of the Lord. In the book of Proverbs, Proverbs is a a book of wisdom. And in this book, it tells you how life is, how life works. There are these things, these wisdom sayings that inform us about how to live wisely and successfully in life. And if you were just to look at the book of Proverbs, you would find this these teachings about the fear of the Lord and the blessings that come to us from the fear of the Lord. For example, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, it says. You can't have true knowledge without the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You can't apply that knowledge so that you live successfully without the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord prolongs life. The fear of the Lord brings strong confidence in our lives. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, it says. And the reward for humility and the fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. All these blessings come to those who have a fear of the Lord. Now, some of you (coughs) who know your Bibles are now being pricked in your minds and you're thinking, wait a second. Doesn't it say in the Bible somewhere that perfect love casts out fear. Doesn't it say that? And you would be right. It does say that. If you look at 1 John 4, 15 to 18, this is what it says. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love of God that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So, when we read that verse, some may think, how could you have a fear of the Lord, and yet perfect love casts out fear. But I would just encourage you to read the text because the text says that we are not to fear punishment. We are not to fear judgment because we as believers stand righteous in Christ because of what Christ has done for us. So on the day of judgment, we don't have to fear. It has nothing to do with the fear of the Lord. We are to have a fear of the Lord, but not fear judgment. So what is this fear? What is reverent fear? Well, reverent fear includes these things like awe and wonder and respect and honor. And literal fear like trembling fear. 
That's something that we sometimes miss. But look at what it says in Psalm 211. It says, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Now, we might ask the question, well, why does God want us to tremble in his presence? Why would God want that? But I think there's a better question for us to ask ourselves. How could you not tremble in the presence of God? How could you not stand before the Lord who is almighty, who is perfectly righteous and holy, who is all just totally pure, who knows our entire lives, who is omniscient, omnipotent, how could you not tremble in his presence? About uh, 10 years ago, our family was uh, given the opportunity to go to the, um, the Seahawks training camp. This is what they do before the season begins. And we were there, and uh, we knew the coach, uh, Rocky Seto. You guys know Rocky, and he's you know, now pastor in a church in Southern California. But at the time, he was one of the coaches for the Seahawks. And we went there, and then he arranged to have Russell Wilson come and meet us after the practice. And so we're all standing there ready to meet him, and he comes over, and you know, everybody's excited to meet him. And he comes through, and he's introducing himself. Hi, I'm Russell Wilson, as if we didn't know who he was, right? And, and um, he comes down the line, and we're shaking his hand, and we're introducing ourselves to him. And he gets to my daughter, Kelly, and she goes, he goes, hi, I'm Russell. And she goes, hi, I'm Michelle. <laughs> and then he walks past her and goes, she goes, no, 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 wait, I'm, I'm not Michelle, I'm Kelly, like he cares, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, he's gone by that time. It was so funny, though, because, you know, she was in this guy's presence. Everybody knows this guy, and she was in awe, like, whoa. And she didn't even know who she was. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, when we are in the Lord's presence, there's something that happens to us. Like, when we really know God... There is something that happens to us, like there's this awe and wonder and, you know, total, like, respect and, like, we want to just give him ourselves and there, might, there would even be trembling, like, we're in the presence of God. See, when you really understand who God is, there's no way you can't feel awe. There's no way you can't feel just this deep, wonder and amazement there's a song that was very popular and it still is very moving it's called i can only imagine and in that song the chorus goes like this it says uh, surrounded by your glory what will my heart feel will i dance for you jesus or in awe of you be still will i stand in your presence or to my knees will i fall Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. And I think that song really captures the wonder that we would experience. And we don't even know how we would be overcome when we are in the presence of God. And what sort of emotions will come over us, how we might sing for joy, or how we might just be speechless. It always uh, sort of amuses me when people say things like, yeah, when I get into the presence of God, I'm going to ask him why he did this or why he didn't do that. And I'm thinking, you have no idea. You're really going to stand in the presence of God and question him? See, this was the God that Noah knew. This is why when God told him he was going to bring a flood he was going to end the world. He was going to destroy the world. That Noah just obeyed. God told him, I want you to build an ark. And he had never seen rain before. He says, I want you to build this thing. And we don't know how long it took him to build. We know that he had three, by the time he was 500 years old, he had three sons. And then we know by the time he was 600 years old, the flood came. So some people think it took him 100 years to build the ark. We don't know. We just know that, you know, when he was 500, he had those three sons. 
But what we do know is that he obeyed God. In fact, in verse 9, or in verse 22, it says, Noah did this. He built the ark. He did all that God commanded him. See, Noah, he understood, and he had, a, he had an understanding of who God was. Those who truly know the Lord fear him. Those who truly know the Lord fear him. And, and those who fear him obey him. Those who fear him are quick to repent from sins. Those who fear him, they walk in humility before him. The people who fear the Lord love to see God worshipped. Those who fear the Lord want to do his will. Want to say yes to God. Those who fear the Lord, they place him above everything else and anyone else. Those are evidences, those are manifestations of the fear of the Lord. You know, it's interesting that even today, the Lord speaks to us through Noah's life. When Jesus spoke of his second coming, he drew a parallel between the times of the end when he would come again and the time of Noah's time, okay? What happened in the days of Noah? Let's read uh, Matthew 24, 36 through 39. It says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. In 2 Peter 2.5, it calls Noah a preacher of righteousness, which suggests that for as long as he was building that ark, however long it was, he was preaching to the people. He was warning them about the coming judgment. He was, he was imploring them to repent. Similarly, God is warning us through his word that well, there will come a judgment, that when he comes again, there will be a judgment. The Bible tells us that Jesus' second coming will be preceded by what's called birth pains. And this is how it describes it in the Bible, that there are going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be persecution against Christians. There's going to be lawlessness that results in people's hearts growing cold. And there's going to be earthquakes and famine and pestilence. Now, you don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't even have to have that much spiritual sensitivity to realize how we are living in days where there's wars and rumors of wars that Christians are being persecuted throughout the world, that there is famine and earthquakes and pestilence, that lawlessness is happening all around us, that people's hearts are growing cold. This past week, I just read about um, how, you know, seismologists are looking at the next big earthquake that's going to come, and they're, they're predicting that, yeah, San Francisco is going to suffer this huge earthquake. And it could happen, they said, it could happen at any moment, actually. And they're talking about San Francisco and the devastation that will happen there. They talked about in Los Angeles and how it happened there. And along the, the rest of the West Coast, Oregon and Washington, too, we're all, it, 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 they're saying it's almost assured that it's going to happen eventually. Now, <clears throat> My concern isn't that we all put together our emergency kits and you know we're safe in that way, although that's not a bad idea to be prepared. Don't get me wrong. But my concern is that we're prepared spiritually, that we are living in a right relationship with God in the fear of the Lord. And if you're living in the fear of the Lord, that means your life is centered around God and his will and what he wants for you. Your life needs to be revolving around his will, not your own will. 
that you're not putting off your relationship with God until a time where it's more convenient. In Matthew 24, 38, it says, For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. Now, there's nothing wrong with eating and drinking. There's nothing wrong with getting married. The, uh, what the writer is saying is he's trying to paint a picture that these people were indifferent to the things of God. They were just going about their life. They were just doing the normal things in their life, but they had no awareness of the impending judgment that was coming. They were indifferent. Noah, the preacher of righteousness, was telling them, hey, it's coming. What's coming? Rain. What's rain? Water. Never seen it like that before. Noah, you're crazy. Yeah, you go ahead. You go ahead and you make that boat. It's sobering to me, that word, that, that phrase, until the day when Noah entered the ark. See, they were going about their business, and then one day God said to Noah, today's the day. Today's the day. And Noah went into the ark, and he shut the door. And to me, that's just sobering when I think about that, that finality that, that Noah listened to God. He's been preaching. He'd been trying to warn people. And God says, it's that day. And he goes in and he closes the ark. It really struck me, too, when I thought about Noah. There were, there were seven other people in that ark with him, Right? But there are others who were left out. And you know what's, a, what's really fascinating to me is um, a couple weeks ago I spoke of Enoch, or last week I spoke about Enoch. And Enoch had um, a son, and that son was Methuselah. Now, what do we know about Methuselah? Anybody know about Methuselah? What's he famous for? He was the oldest person who ever lived. 969 years he lived, it says. Now, you might wonder, how does people live that long? Well, you got to remember, you know, there was a different environment back then, and sin hadn't taken its full effect on, on the human race, and God had allowed people to live a lot longer back then. 969 years. Methuselah had a son named Lamech. Lamech had a son named Noah. Now, what's fascinating to me is, I like to geek out sometimes, and I started to do the math. And in the Bible, it mentions how long people lived and certain dates and times and stuff like that. And what I discovered was this. Methuselah lived to be 969 years old. He would have died the year of the flood. Which strongly suggests he died in the flood. And I thought about Noah his grandfather being on the outside of that ark. And I thought about the day that he had, was told to go into that ark and close the door. And it struck me how Noah was this preacher of righteousness and he had to give a hard message that there was an impending judgment coming and no one listened to him not even his own grandfather. See, his father had died five years before the flood, but his grandfather was still around. And it just made me sad when I thought about that. Just as assuredly that God brought judgment on the world in the days of Noah, he is once again going to bring his judgment in the days to come. We don't know when that is. We just know it will be. God has spoken, and it will be so. But the judgment that is going to come is going to be different because it's going to be a final judgment. And there's not going to be a wooden boat to save us. 
because he's already provided a wooden cross to save us. See, the Lord has given us, his church, the signs of the times. And he's given us this warning. And he's preaching to us, much like Noah preached to those people, he has preached to us saying, here are some signs I want to give you. There are going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be an increase in earthquakes and pestilence. Can you say viruses? There's going to be these things. Christians are going to get persecuted. And I read just about every week how Christians are being persecuted all across this world. There are going to be these signs. People's hearts are going to grow cold. There's going to be lawlessness, a disregard for even the laws of the land and God's moral laws. There's just going to be a disregard for these things. And he's saying, I just want you to know these things are going to happen. And in response to that, we could be about our business or God's business. We could be giving ourselves and marrying, being married, eating and drinking, just life as usual. Or we could say, you know what? I fear God. I believe God. I'm going to obey God. I'm going to follow what he wants me to do. I'm going to seek him out. I'm going to have a friendship with God. When Noah entered the ark, the door closed, and that was it. When Christ comes, when Christ comes, that will be it. Now, in light of this reality, I just want to share with you this amazingly encouraging verse. And it's found in Acts chapter 9, verse 31. I love this. It says this. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. It multiplied. This is a distinction between what was happening in Noah's day and what could be happening in our day. See, in Noah's day, Noah was a preacher of righteousness and no one listened to him. But when Christ has come, he came and he will come again. And when he came the first time, the church was filled with the fear of the Lord. And they were following him and they were doing what he wanted them to do. And they, were, they, they had been transformed and they were giving and, and serving and they were, they were caring for one another in ways that were unprecedented. And they were bringing the gospel to places and to people everywhere and it said the church multiplied see you and I when we live in the fear of the Lord that means our lives are oriented around what he wants and I think God will use us to bring this hope that we have to a world that apart from Christ faces an eternity apart from him That's such a beautiful and powerful verse. See, the fear of the Lord is not an Old Testament concept. It is a thing that is for God's people for all time. The church walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and it multiplied. People came to trust Jesus. People, God's people, were walking in obedient fear of him and sharing the gospel, and the Holy Spirit was moving. And I think that as I envision our church family and a church family that's filled with people who are fearing God, I mean, we fear the Lord. We do what he wants us to do. And in spite of what the world might say, we're going to do what God wants us to do. And I think God will honor that. I think God loves it when his people take that kind of stand and say, this is how we're going to live. This is how we're going to worship. So um, 
I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. And um, we're going to have an opportunity for you to receive prayer today if you'd love to receive prayer. Uh, we have intercessors here. They have the glow sticks on, and they'd love to pray for you. And uh, whatever need you might have today, uh, just feel free to bring it before the Lord. And if, if you just want to just continue to grow in your faith today, uh, maybe it's specifically in the fear of the Lord and growing in, that, in the knowledge of what that all means, or if there's any other expression of faith that you feel like you want to grow in, just please come up and receive prayer. Oftentimes, that's the first step in the journey of faith for God to really deepen you in your faith. I'm going to have a stand right now, and I'm going to ask you to join me as I just uh, commit this time, this next uh, space to, to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for Noah, his life, and how he had a reverent fear of you, how he was willing to just obey you and to build an ark before there was even uh, a, a drop of rain. Lord, we thank you that through his faith, we could be instructed. And through his life, we could be reminded that even as there was a judgment that came upon the world because of the wickedness that was going on all around, that even in our day, we know that there will also, there will also be a judgment and our hearts break because of that. I know yours does too. And Lord, we thank you that you made a provision for Noah and his family to be saved through the ark. And for us today, you've made a provision through the cross. And because of the cross, we don't have to fear punishment. We don't even have to fear death. But we can live in peace knowing that you have made us right with yourself through the blood of Christ. Father, though, Help us to understand how to live in the fear of the Lord, how to honor you, how to respect you, how to place your voice above every other voice in our life. Lord, would you help us as we live this way to be strong and courageous? Thank you, God. We love you. We honor you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.